Ecology or Catastrophe, The Life of Murray Bookchin, by Janet Beale, published by Oxford University Press, 2015. Chapter 9, Anti-Nuclear Activist In the summer of 1977, the renowned anthropologist Margaret Mead visited the ISE as a guest speaker. As she toured Kate Farm, taking in the solar buildings, the windmills, the dome, and the raised bed gardens, she nodded approvingly but then as she was leaving, she turned and waved her stick at it all. You know, she said, it won't do a bit of good if we don't stop nuclear power. Meade had reason to be concerned, about 75 nuclear reactors had been built since 1966, arousing ever more unease about the likelihood of accidents and the absence of a safe way to dispose of radioactive wastes. A year before her visit to the ISE, the Public Service Company, PSCO, of New Hampshire had gained permission from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to construct two reactors next to a broad expanse of salt marshes, estuaries, and tidal mudflats in the sleepy coastal town of Seabrook, New Hampshire. PSCO planned to run a pair of giant two-mile-long pipes from the reactors through the marshes to the Atlantic. The pipes would suck in a billion gallons of seawater every day to cool the reactors and turn the turbines, then return the water to the ocean, 40 degrees warmer. The huge soft-shell clam bed in the shoreline's delicate ecosystem could not possibly survive those elevated temperatures. In July 1976, as bulldozers began clearing the site, 32 activists gathered in nearby Rye to form the Clamshell Alliance to fight the project. They were inspired by a remarkable action at Will, in southwestern Germany the year before. In February 1975 a nuclear power plant had been slated to be constructed at will. By the time the German bulldozers arrived, groups of protesters were already in place, peacefully occupying the construction site. Police dragged them away but tens of thousands occupied it again, not only activists and students but local citizens. They set up an encampment of huts and tents, an alternative village. This time the police left it in place, and in March a court withdrew the reactor's construction license. The reactor was never built. The Clamshell Alliance, many of whose founders were Quakers, intended to follow Will as its model. They would occupy the Seabrook construction site peaceably, using nonviolent direct action, and rally the seacoast community against the reactors. At their early organizational meetings, the clams agreed that they would make decisions by consensus, that is, in making decisions, they would try to achieve unanimity. Consensus process, which they learned from the Quakers, seemed superior to traditional majority rule voting, consensus was inclusive, accommodating everyone's ideas, whereas majority voting was win-slash-lose, it permitted only one view to prevail, and the minority had to put up with it. The original clams were a small group of friends brimming with goodwill, their meetings relatively informal, so they easily achieved consensus among themselves and forged ahead. In preparation for occupying the Seabrook site, a group of 18 clams practiced doing civil disobedience and role-played possible encounters with police. They schooled one another to avoid doing anything that might provoke a confrontation. On August 1, 1976, some 600 clams gathered at Seabrook, and the 18 who had undergone nonviolence training made their way to the construction site, where they planted some pine and maple saplings. When PSCO requested that they leave, they sat down and refused. A squadron of state police then dragged them, limp, to the station and charged them with criminal trespass. The next site occupation was to take place three weeks later. About 180 people volunteered to do civil disobedience and underwent training in six to eight hour sessions. Quaker clam Suki Rice decided to train them in small groups, she called them affinity groups. It's unclear where she got that phrase, one historian says it was her informal innovation, but by 1976 Bookchin's much read post scarcity anarchism had long since popularized the term. In any case Rice's affinity groups were organized for the practical purpose of nonviolence training. When August 22 arrived, the 180 clams occupied the site, they were arrested, went limp, and got dragged into buses. <laughs>
They declined bail and were taken to the National Guard Armory in Portsmouth. Most were released the next morning. This second action generated headlines, and new members flooded into the Clamshell Alliance, from the feminist, Native American rights, labor, and environmental movements. They showed up at meetings eager to put their bodies on the line. The next action was scheduled for April 1977, and the Clams organized them into affinity groups for nonviolence training. During the winter of 1976-77, Clamshell's Congresses adopted an organizational structure to accommodate the growing alliance. It set up a coordinating committee, CC, consisting of representatives from the various regions of New England. But the CC was not empowered to make decisions. Rather, all clams were to participate in decision-making and work to achieve consensus. When an issue arose requiring a decision, the CC would discuss it and develop a position or positions on it, the representatives would take the CC's position, s, back to their respective regions, which would discuss and arrive at their own positions, the reps would then bring the region's positions to the next CC meeting. To harmonize the region's positions, the reps would hammer out a compromise which they would then take back to their regions for discussion and, they hoped, approval. Usually an issue would go back and forth between the regions and the CC for weeks, or even months, before consensus could be reached. The CC adhered scrupulously to this process, even as it became lengthy and cumbersome. The creation of Clamshell gratified Book Chin, who had opposed nuclear power since the 1950s and had helped prevent construction of the Ravenswood reactor in the 1960s. Now here was a whole movement dedicated to challenging it through an ethically charged revolt. Furthermore, the movement wasn't Marxist, it had a libertarian structure, and the members were even forming affinity groups. Book Chin joined eagerly with high expectations. He understood that the clamshell's use of the term affinity group was not like his own or the Spanish anarchists. Clam affinity groups were ad hoc, made up of strangers who underwent training together to carry out a predetermined action, then disbanded. Bookchin's affinity groups were more autonomous, ongoing groups of brothers and sisters who knew each other well and coalesced to be politically creative together, to conceive and carry out actions collectively. He and some friends at the ISE formed the Spruce Mountain Affinity Group, named after a mountain near Goddard, in order to be part of Clamshell. Bookchin's friends in Boston, who had adopted the name Black Rose, formed an affinity group in this vein as well, it was separate from the main, Quaker-dominated Boston group. Other groups were formed around Vermont, and on July 30, 1977, they met at Goddard and formed the Green Mountain Alliance. As the clamshell continued to grow, Book Chin knew, its democratic ethos would likely be challenged. Often in loosely structured, egalitarian organizations, some members who covet control take on de facto leadership roles, and the very absence of structure allows them to accumulate informal power without accountability to the rest. Clamshell would have to prevent that from happening. It needed a well-defined structure, yet one that was compatible with a libertarian ethos. Book Chin thought of the manuscript that had been lying in his drawer for the past few years. He hadn't yet finished writing The Spanish Anarchists, partly because the story's denouement was so heartbreaking, the CNT leadership had betrayed anarchism by joining the Popular Front government, which had contributed to the movement's destruction. How could he present the Spanish anarchists as some kind of model, when their prominent members had in the end trampled on their own principles. But the manuscript, originally written to rebut new left criticisms of anarchism as disorganized, described a large-scale, democratic, libertarian organizational structure that had persisted for decades. As this very question was looming over clamshell, the Times cried out for the Spanish story to be told. So he decided to finish the manuscript, call it Volume 1, and defer the story of the 1936-37 betrayals to a second volume. He finished volume 1 and dedicated it to Russell Blackwell, Mi Amigo y Mi Companero. Free Life Editions published it in 1977. In preparation for Clamshell's next planned occupation of the Seabrook site, nonviolence training proceeded fast and furious. <laughs>
Then on the morning of Saturday, April 30, 1977, 2,000 protesters converged at Seabrook, among them a contingent from the ISE. Organized into affinity groups, they pitched their tents in the construction area in orderly rows, dug latrines, and laid out roads, creating a village they called Freebrook. By consensus, they made a decision to ban all nuclear material within its limits. The occupiers slept there overnight, then awoke on Sunday to find National Guards arrayed around them. The state governor warned them to evacuate within 20 minutes or face arrest. Most stayed put. Police arrested 1,414 and herded them onto buses that took them to the Portsmouth Armory. It wasn't big enough to hold such a large group, so the National Guard dispersed them to several more armories around the state. During the two weeks of their incarceration, as Brian Toker, one of the detainees, told me, the affinity groups took on a new function, they structured how people incarcerated together could make decisions collectively while enduring harassment by police. In the process, the incarcerated clams reconceived the affinity group as a unit much more like what Book Chin had intended, one that could form the basis for a much more widely participatory, directly democratic form of movement organization. As it happened, in advance of the occupation, Clamshell co-founder Howie Hawkins had invited Murray to speak at Dartmouth the first week in May. Murray had asked, Have you read my writings? I'm a revolutionary anarchist. Are you sure you want me? When the date came, the 1400 clams were still in the armories. He agreed to speak on the spot, Hawkins recalls, at a demonstration in solidarity with them. He held the crowd with a rousing five-minute speech off the top of his head on the dangers of nuclear power and the power of popular direct action. He could have kept the crowd listening intently all that evening if we had let him go on. After two weeks, most of the charges were dismissed, and the clams were released. The expanding anti-nuclear movement was jubilant, considering the action a triumph for nonviolent mobilization. Book Chin lauded the return to the a lot of the civil rights and anti-war movements of the mid-1960s. Indeed the site occupations represented an advance over those movements, he said, because they constituted anarchist direct action, in which the individual recovers her or his social being, a sense of power over events, and meaning as an active human being. All in all, the occupations produced a thrilling sense of hope among radicals nationwide. That summer the ISE attracted 150 students for its 12-week session. New practical workshops taught the students skills in electrical wiring and plumbing, soldering and welding, and carpentry. One class constructed an entire garage using only native materials and hand tools. Structures were designed and redesigned, built and rebuilt, several times, so students could gain hands-on experience. Carl Hess marveled, the hippies have dropped their flowers and picked up wrenches and hammers. They plunged into ecotechnics work. One group built flatplate solar collectors from scratch and installed them in the sunhouse for year-round aquaculture. Another designed a parabolic concentrating solar collector, which moved water on the principle that hot water rises. An instructor bought up some old wind generators from Midwestern farms and brought them to the ISE, where the students refurbished them into usable turbines. The class designed a sailwing wind power system, with 22-foot Dacron sails, and set it up on a 30-foot steel tower near the sunhouse. Used to pump water for solar heating into a storage tank, it spins in even the gentlest breeze. The biological agriculture students dug 33 French intensive beds, as well as ordinary beds, for controls, so they could observe the difference. The produce grown in the intensive beds, they found, outshone the controls in vitality, health, and taste. Nearby they planted marigolds, nasturtiums, sage, and peppermint around cabbage plots, to see whether these companion plants could fend off insects. Student Callie O'Neill designed what she called a solar shield garden, using algae-laden water from five tilapia ponds as fertilizer. The garden just went ballistic, crazy wild, like a garden on steroids, she said. Students planted an herb garden, constructed sprouting frames for alfalfa sprouts, 
and built a root cellar in the farmhouse basement, they built cold frames, along a wall of the compost shed, where plants could survive into the winter. In their downtime, they'd swim in the Winooski River. Murray, who stayed on dry land, was a big Russian teddy bear, O'Neill told me. Sometimes he'd come up to the student's dorm with some vodka, and we'd share a shot with him. O'Neill marveled at how polite and gracious he was. If he had to interrupt, he was so patient, he was excuse me please, thank you so much. He was the most courteous conversationalist I'd ever met. During the three-month session, the students bonded as a community. A hundred fifty people came together and fell in love, O'Neill told me. But no matter what project people were working on, when it was time for Book Chin to lecture, everybody, faculty and students, went to listen. We'd all get to the barn early, we didn't want to miss a word, O'Neill said. And he'd mesmerize everyone. He'd lecture for three hours, non-stop, no notes, full throttle, people on the edge of their seats. He'd build up his ideas on democracy and the history of civilization very methodically, presenting them in a spellbinding way. He was a force of nature. Even the technically oriented people appreciated his historical perspective. He'd always blow everyone away, recalled Joseph Kiefer, who specialized in organic farming. We realized it's not just about systems, said Costa Pierce. It's about people, it's about gender, families, community. One night we all went to hear Murray talk at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Murray was the man. There were thousands of people. By the time he was done, people were yelling Amen, brother. People were screaming and laughing and crying. And there was a giant roar, and everybody got up and we roared again. That speech was one of the greatest I've ever seen anyone give. At summer's end, many of the students agreed that the ISE session was the best, most productive, metamorphosizing experience we had ever had. It was transformational for many of us, recalled Kiefer. Without question he inspired what I do today he told me, which was to connect local food growers with local human service agencies. But you know, Murray would drive everywhere, Kiefer told me. He'd eat at McDonald's. It was that proletarian thing. Jim Morley entered Ramapo College as an angry young freshman in 1976. I was really pissed off as a kid, he recalled. But when he sat down in Professor Bookchin's classroom, ready to act out against authority the man who stood at the front of the room drove all such ideas from his mind. He was dressed like a janitor, with baggy green pants and a tire air pressure gauge in his front pocket. When he opened his mouth, he spoke as a New Yorker, in our working class idiom, to children of parents who did not go to college. As he listened, Morley thought, this is in my blood, this is me. Book Chin took anger like Morley's and gave it intellectual voice. He rarely bothered to consult a syllabus or look at any notes. He would orate extemporaneously eloquently and he made perfect sense. He spoke in earnest and passionate monologues. I was in absolute awe of Murray, said Morley. He was my ideal of a human being. For his part, Book Chin enjoyed mentoring a generation of ecological revolutionaries. To these children of Ford Assembly plant workers, Book Chin narrated the history of capitalism, as interpreted less by Marx than by the economic historian Karl Polanyi. His book The Great Transformation, 1944, taught, as Book Chin put it, that contrary to popular belief, the rise of capitalism was not inevitable, people were dragged into capitalism screaming, shouting and fighting all along the way, trying to resist this industrial and commercial world. They resisted being reduced from communal beings to monadic egos. They resisted the reduction of social relations to exchange relations. Now today he told his students, we must resist the dissolution of neighborhoods into suburbs, of retail shops into shopping malls. The market economy is becoming the market society transforming everything into a commodity. And in the process capitalism is disassembling the biosphere, reversing the evolutionary process.
a lot of teachers just want 45 minutes, recalled Wayne Hayes, but at the 45-minute mark, Murray was just getting warmed up. The academic mind, Hayes explained, is trained to be narrow and to focus on particular subfields, and you're not supposed to roam beyond the boundaries. But Book Chin had no patience for that, his mind was synoptic, able to pull things together. He didn't take grading seriously, anyone who showed up regularly in class got an A. If a student didn't do the work, he or she would just get an incomplete. While the students loved his grading policy the dean did not. But otherwise the Ramapo administration was delighted with Book Chin. On September 1, 1977, the one-time high school dropout achieved the rank of full professor. That fall the anti-nuclear movement was ballooning. Activists around the country organized groups, modeled on clamshell, to occupy nuclear sites non-violently, the Abalone Alliance in California, the Catfish Alliance in Florida, the Shad Alliance in New York, and so on. The movement had verve and nerve, and its peaceful yet feisty protests attracted members in droves. In New England, the clamshell, too, expanded rapidly. In November 1977 a Congress of 2,000 clams met at Putney, Vermont, to decide on the next step. Some wanted to do another site occupation, this time installing windmills and solar panels. But others thought clamshell should step away from direct action for now and concentrate on educating other groups. The plenary, searching for consensus on the issue, got bogged down, the meeting dragged on for 12 hours. Many got tired and left. At 6 a.m. the rump agreed to go the route of a new site occupation that would not only protest but actually try to prevent construction. They scheduled it for June 24, 1978. In preparation, the clamshell produced a handbook that affirmed that affinity groups are the basic decision-making structure for the occupation, allowing for decentralized tactical decision-making through the use of consensus, in which all participants have a voice. Book Chin's 1969 article A Note on Affinity Groups, from Post-Scarcity Anarchism, was copied and inserted. Clamshell was made up of affinity groups, he noted with satisfaction, networked egalitarian style, like the spokes of a wheel, rather than hierarchically, like the steps of a ladder. In other words, its practice is anarchist. In the fall of 1977 the Spanish Anarchists was published. This first history of Spanish anarchism to be written in English, historian George Woodcock observed in a review, provided a sense of the humane in anarchism. The book would make many readers revise considerably their views of anarchism, he predicted, which was what Bookchin intended. Finally and most important, the left now had a documented study of anarchist organization, and the anti-nuclear movement could grasp the Spanish roots of its affinity groups. Clamshell's occupations of the Seabrook site had hitherto been logistically uncomplicated, the demonstrators had simply stepped into the wide open construction area. But this time, in anticipation of the June 24th occupation, PSCO surrounded the site with a chain-link fence, topped with barbed wire. Some clam affinity groups, like Bookchin Spruce Mountain and the Radicals in Boston, saw the fence as no obstacle, they'd simply cut it, as Ecology Action East had done at Squatters Park, proceed with the occupation, and get arrested as planned. But other clams, especially those influenced by Quakerism, objected to fence cutting as an act of destruction and hence of violence. They would not go along with it. Several members of the CC held this view. The argument raged across the alliance. Much logistical planning of the occupation can't proceed until this question is settled, noted the CC. But the question was far from settled, on this issue, the clams could not achieve consensus, not even close. A few weeks before the June 24th date, the New Hampshire Attorney General Tom Rath took to the airwaves and made a proposal. The Clamshell Alliance should set aside its plan for an illegal site occupation, leave the fence intact, and instead hold a legal rally in an area just outside the fence. It could protest nuclear power, then leave the site before the construction workers arrived on Monday morning. 
Clamshell now had to decide whether to accept Rath's proposal. Most of its 55 affinity groups across New England opposed it, on the grounds that the Putney Congress had consensually agreed on the site occupation. They wanted to proceed as planned and cut the fence. But the Quaker-oriented members, including those on the CC, preferred accepting Rath's proposal to cutting the fence. Counter-proposals and negotiations flew back and forth between center and periphery but time was running short, and consensus remained remote, both sides had dug in. Finally the CC members who supported the legal rally made an end run around the process, they went directly to the media and simply announced that the Clamshell Alliance had cancelled the illegal site occupation and accepted Rath's offer. They had no power whatsoever to make such a decision, they created a fait accompli simply by announcing it. In Vermont we learned about the decision over the radio said Book Chin. The legal rally, held on June 24-25, 1978, attracted 18,000 people. When Book Chin and his affinity group arrived, they rubbed their eyes in disbelief. The Seabrook marshland had been transformed into an energy fair, with tents, geodesic domes, small windmills, solar cookers, and bicycle generators. There were displays and food stands and concession booths, jugglers, and Sufi dancers, it was like a carnival midway. On an impromptu stage, Jackson Brown and Arlo Guthrie sang, and Pete Seeger and Dick Gregory spoke. As I wandered around Seabrook during the Woodstock of 1978, said Book Chin, people were rocking along with the stars. It wasn't even a rally, it was an event to be consumed, a star-studded legal festival. A spectacle. Stunned, 200 or so New England radicals huddled to share their feelings of betrayal and to take stock of what had happened. The CC had unilaterally overturned a legitimate decision. Did the committee claim to be running the alliance now, rather than merely coordinating it? Were the affinity groups from now on merely to follow its orders? The dissenters constituted themselves as a caucus within the clamshell, called clams for democracy to challenge the CC and fight for the power of the affinity groups. On Sunday evening the rally organizers tore down the energy fair and duly carted all the exhibits away. Governor Meldrum Thompson, who had once referred to the clamshell alliance as a lawless mob, pronounced it regenerated and rehabilitated. The CC, fearing a hemorrhage of clamshell membership, sent reps around New England to try to soothe the outraged feelings. At a meeting in Montpelier, the reps urged the Vermonters to remain in the alliance. And they asked the Vermonters, by the way, to stop talking so incessantly about hierarchy. The clamshell should focus solely on shutting down nuclear reactors, they said, in order to win mass support. Leave everything else alone. Nonsense, said Book Chin. Nuclear power wasn't a problem of technology, it was a problem of society. Any viable anti-nuclear movement must challenge the social institutions and the domineering sensibilities that led to nuclear power plants in the first place. That July Book Chin drafted a constitution for the clamshell, one that would empower local affinity groups as the alliance's base. Rather than be temporary ad hoc training units for civil disobedience, they would be the alliance's permanent fundamental unit, embedded in a democratic structure. Every month the affinity groups would send spokespersons to a regional coordinating meeting, when that meeting had a decision to make, the spokes would vote only as mandated by the affinity group that sent them, and should the spokes fail to do so, they would be recalled. An alliance-wide committee would be elected at annual congresses. This structure all but guaranteed that power would rise from the bottom up. The clamshell would be, in effect, a confederation of affinity groups, inspired by the Spanish anarchists' history. I brought in stuff from the CNT and FAI, Book Chin recalled, and the Spruce Mountain affinity group signed it. In July 1978 Clams for Democracy gathered for a conference at Hampshire College and considered, among other things, this proposed constitution. While they agreed that affinity groups should be the clamshell's basic unit, they objected to the levels of regional and alliance-wide coordination. Affinity groups alone should constitute the alliance, they insisted, with no coordinating tiers. Second, 
they rejected nonviolent civil disobedience as the means of opposing Seabrook, it was too passive. Confrontational direct action should replace it. In other words, Toker told me, we said, we're going to cut the fence. Third, clamshell should oppose nuclear power alone, it should oppose all hierarchy and domination and seek a large-scale transformation of the society that was trying to impose nuclear power regardless of the popular will. In advance of this Hampshire conference, Boston's anarchist affinity group Hard Rain had recruited as a potential ally the Red Balloon, a Marxist collective based in Brooklyn. Book Chin was alarmed, if his life experience from the YCL to SDS had taught him anything, it was don't work with Marxists. But now even as late as 1978, naive, well-intentioned young people were once again succumbing to the fatal attraction and even welcoming Marxists into a promising movement. He objected vociferously to Red Balloon's presence. His young friends were bewildered. Instead of talking about what we had in common, Murray spent a lot of time arguing with them, Toker recalled. He didn't even want to discuss more theoretical issues, John Lepper told me. But for Book Chin, theoretical issues became meaningless when Marxists were around. He told Toker that if Clams for Democracy admitted Red Balloon, it would go nowhere. I didn't agree, said Toker, to which Murray responded, you're too nice, you get along with too many different people. Book Chin dropped out of Clams for Democracy. Over the next year, these radical clams would go on to scale the Seabrook fence using ladders and ropes, when they climbed down on the other side, police arrested them. When they went at the fence with wire cutters, police drove them back with clubs, mace, tear gas, and fire hoses. Their direct actions, while confrontational, failed to energize the movement or even generate media coverage. In the summer of 1978, the ISC's study of ecotechnics surged. A wind power instructor conceived of an elaborate sensor to monitor the comparative temperatures in the two greenhouses and outdoors, the students designed and built it. Students set up a wind charger atop the chicken coop, and they installed solar panels for a hot water system on the farmhouse. They grew watercress, tomatoes, and green peppers hydroponically, a biofilter was used to remove fish wastes from the water. Master's student Barry Pierce studied food production by aquaculture in passive solar greenhouses. Between October 1977 and February 1979, he cultured rainbow trout, carp, tilapia, yellow perch, and achieved a growth rate of 106 pounds per year. Even New Alchemy, where the technique had originated, was impressed. The short film Carl Hess, Toward Liberty shows the ISC's wind machines and solar greenhouse in their mountain setting. On the Lower East Side, Charis and its youth cadres continued to manufacture geodesic domes for use as greenhouses and closed-loop aquaculture systems on rooftops, and they transformed an abandoned building on Avenue B for their headquarters. On Lois Aida, ecotechnics could indeed provide a base for self-reliance. Much to Book Chin's amazement, the United States had engendered an anarchist political party, the Libertarian Party founded in 1971. It was pro-capitalist, to be sure, but its very existence suggested to Murray that an indigenous American streak of anti-statism, or anti-governmentalism, was growing in popularity. In 1978 he keynoted a Libertarian Party meeting in Boston. When he told the 150 right-wing libertarians that America needed to become a society free of bureaucracy and centralization and hierarchy they gave him a standing ovation. Afterward, an interviewer asked him if he thought it inconsistent for libertarians to try to achieve their ends through a political party, he agreed that it was, but he defended a libertarian use of the political process at the local level, based on neighborhood groups. I find it perfectly consistent he replied, for libertarians to operate on the municipal or county level, where they are close to the people. As they had done, for example in Amsterdam and Montreal. In 1977, however, the Montreal Citizens Movement had undergone a split. The conventional pragmatists within it had had enough of the party's libertarian socialist program, the one calling for neighborhood empowerment. 
they left and formed their own new party the Municipal Action Group, MAG, with a conventional structure and the conventional aim of attracting business to Montreal. In the next municipal election, in 1978, the MCM, the MAG, and Drapeau's old civic party would square off. The socialists, anarchists, and community activists went all out for the MCM. And on election day, the Montreal citizens went to the polls, and voted for a restoration of King Drapeau, giving his civic party 53 out of 55 council seats. The MCM and the MAG got one seat apiece. The MCM radicals were shocked, the citizens had massively, and democratically, repudiated all their work to build neighborhood democracy. We did a post-mortem, Rousseau Polas told me. We had a packed meeting at a Spanish restaurant in downtown Montreal. Where do we go from here, was the question. Most of the anarchists concluded that electoral politics was hopeless and left the MCM. Rousseau Polas chose to stay and try to salvage something from the disaster, but in the next months the MCM dropped the radical elements in its 1976 program, then abandoned it altogether. The defeat in Montreal was a symptom of changing times. Over the course of the 1970s, once alternative institutions had gradually given up their revolutionary aims and gone straight, when they did not perish altogether. Food and other cooperatives, in order to survive, adopted the ways of conventional business enterprises. Community organizations shed their demands for neighborhood power and applied for the Carter administration's community development block grants. The government wanted enterprise rather than political action in the neighborhood, Milton Kotler observed caustically. It would move the people out of the meeting hall and put them behind cash registers. Bookchin had long insisted that ecotechnics was inseparable from eco-communities, but it turned out that solar panels and wind turbines could indeed be divorced from a radical social program. The highest profile advocate of alternative technology and renewable energy Amory Lovins, shared his advice with a gaggle of corporations, Bank of America, Dow, Lockheed Martin, Monsanto, among many others, and even with the U.S. government. If Amory Lovins and his ilk can place their at know-how in the service of the Pentagon, Murray lamented, then the environmentalist movement might just as well incorporate and sell itself to Exxon. When Jerry Brown was elected governor of California in 1975, he hired Bookchin's friend and renewable energy expert Wilson Clark as his principal energy advisor. The one-time ultra-revolutionary Tom Hayden, whom Bookchin could not interest in ecology in 1968, got on board with Brown to promote solar energy and social justice causes. Ecotechnics, Murray was dismayed to admit, could be decoupled from decentralism and stripped of its revolutionary potential, and even be put to use by corporations and the state, to shore up domination, with solar power utilities, space satellites, and an organic agribusiness. Meanwhile the incipient neighborhood power movement for urban decentralization was being reversed. In New York, the new mayor, Edward Koch called on young suburbanites to come back to the city and help rebuild it. Investment returned to neighborhoods in New York and other cities, and gentrification began, under the euphemism urban renaissance. Outside the large cities, the post-war suburban boom was producing a distorted kind of decentralization that was not what Bookchin had meant at all. Urban sprawl was a mere diffusion of the metropolis, dependent on automobiles and highways and typified by visual blight, shopping malls, residential subdivisions, tract housing, and industrial and office parks, places that made community and civic participation all but impossible. In the Sun Belt, new cities were constructed that lacked any neighborhoods at all. The new urban agglomerations, urbanization without cities, Bookchin would call them, negated the humanly scaled town and city and replaced neighborhood solidarity with worship of the cult of business. Residents of suburb and megalopolis alike, far from being active citizens, were ever more a passive client population, paying taxes in exchange for services. As for the environmental movement, it continued along the road to reformism that Bookchin had criticized, concentrating its efforts on lobbying in Washington. In his widely reprinted 1980 open letter to the ecology movement, 
Buk Chin pointed out once again that attempting to rectify specific ecological problems, as environmentalists were doing, was mere tinkering, to address the ecology crisis at its root causes, a majoritarian movement had to emerge to challenge the market economy as well as the social system of hierarchy and domination. During the 1970s, various individual elements of his program had been detached from the whole only to be absorbed into the existing system in distorted form, ecology had been narrowed to environmentalism, the cooperatives that survived had become enterprises, decentralization had been warped into sprawl, and ecotechnics had become interesting to government and corporations. It was the unity of my views, he lamented, that gave them a radical thrust. In 1978 a new voluntary simplicity movement arose advocating an anti-materialist lifestyle, it considered living simply, with minimal goods and services, to be the proper ecological choice, one that would bring inner richness. But as always, proposals for material renunciation struck the proletarian-minded Bookchin as elitist, demanding sacrifices of those least able to make them. You could impose bridge tolls or raise the price of gasoline, he objected, but that would only hurt low-income and poor people while the rich would sail over those toll bridges and fill up their gas tanks unscathed. They have chauffeurs. They have the means to pay. As for organic food, it was too expensive for most working-class people to buy with any regularity, I can't afford it. I buy cheap food at the supermarket. In these years, too, the New Age, a Western adaptation of Asian spirituality, had arisen as an alternative culture and was winning the hearts and minds of one-time ecological radicals. Valuing a sense of cosmic oneness or unity with nature, it fed into a new ecological spirituality. Bookchin thought any spirituality was a step backward, since it represented a renunciation of reason and action, as in the Taoist concept of Wu Wei, in favor of mysticism, political passivity and withdrawal into private life. He preferred the Western disposition for rationally and actively attempting to understand the unknown rather than passively worshipping it, and for actively attempting to change society for the better rather than passively accepting an unjust or unfree status quo. The dynamism of the ancient Greek tradition held far more appeal for him than the Indian and Chinese ideas that fed the New Age, it offered rational, technical, and ethical inspiration for developing human-oriented technologies and communities. He undertook a study of Greek political and nature philosophy. As for the young radical intellectuals who had entered the universities, they were finding ever more satisfaction in exploring the copious and sometimes contradictory writings of Karl Marx. In 1973 the Grundriss, written in 1858, got its first English translation. Works of the so-called Western Marxists were translated, too, like George Lukacs's History and Class Consciousness, 1923, English translation 1972, and Karl Korsch's Marxism and Philosophy, 1923, English 1970. But in Bookchin's view, these new Marxist writings not only exhibited the familiar limitations of Marxism, they were burdened with theoretics so abstract and arcane that they were an obstacle to actual political organizing among ordinary people. The situationist Guy Debord talked of the theory of the spectacle Murray often observed, but it was becoming more accurate to speak of the spectacle of theory. Bookchin respected Marxism for what it had been in its time, but that time had come and gone, and these neo-Marxist academics were working with a corpse. Worse in their attempts to revive it, they were adorning the corpse with ideas that were foreign to it, like feminism and communitarianism, and thereby reducing gender and community to matters of economics. Worst of all, in Bookchin's eyes, they were trying to present Marx as some kind of early ecologist. This was more than Murray could bear. Yes, Marx's passages about town and country had influenced him long ago, but they were marginal to Marx's thought, Marx had fundamentally regarded the conquest of nature as a prerequisite for the socialization of humanity. He had commended bourgeois society for rendering nature purely an object for humankind, purely a matter of utility, and he praised science's discovery of nature's laws, the better to subjugate nature under human needs, whether as an object of consumption or as a means of production. In other words, 
Marx had welcomed the domination of nature as a prerequisite for human progress. Moreover, Marxism was indelibly authoritarian. Marx and Engels had regarded authority as essential for disciplining the proletariat and enforcing obedience, Engels had explicitly praised the factory as a school for hierarchy for obedience and command. Marx had even thought capitalism, by destroying earlier economic forms and developing technology had played a historically progressive role. He thought class society had been historically necessary to achieve humanity's ultimate liberation. Such notions, Book Chin wrote, made Marxism, all appearances to the contrary the most sophisticated ideology of advanced capitalism. Neo-Marxists could not have it both ways, Marxism was quite simply incompatible with ecology. By trying to fit the expansive new social movements, ecology feminism, and community, onto the archaic Procrustean frame of Marxian economics, they were obstructing the development of a successor ideology one that would be ethical and anti-hierarchical with a truly revolutionary conception of freedom. He carried the battle to academic conferences, challenging academic Marxists to their faces. In May 1980, at UCLA, he discoursed to some of the other professors on anarchist history. Murray's command of political history had us all spellbound, Karl Boggs recalled, until the wee hours. After everyone else went to bed, he stayed up writing a 25-page talk. That afternoon 59-year-old Book Chin strode to the podium and delivered a breathtaking tour de force on the long and tortured relationship between Marxism and anarchism, showing no signs of travel, the late-night soliloquy, or the vodka. As the day was winding down, Murray was quite prepared to extend the theoretical debate for many more hours just as the rest of us were completely overwhelmed by exhaustion. In March 1979 the partial meltdown of a reactor core at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania spurred tens of thousands to join the anti-nuclear movement. But in Book Chin's view, as the movement grew in popularity its leaders were neutralizing its radical message. The same people who had high-handedly quashed the 1978 Seabrook action were now going on to become star-tripping celebrities and were turning the potentially revolutionary anti-nuclear movement into a harmless frolic. No nukes concerts were held at Madison Square Garden, then at Battery Park, where the performers called for ending nuclear power but said nothing about hierarchy or capitalism or the nation-state. The huge audiences passively consumed these spectacles rather than taking action. Anti-nuclear politics was being transmuted into concerts, albums, and movies. When Book Chin's 1980 open letter was published in Win magazine, Pete Seeger wrote a rebuttal. Fundraising through concerts was part of movement building, he scolded Book Chin, entertainers as activists were just trying to keep the poor who may still inherit the earth from inheriting more than a poisonous garbage dump. He accused Murray of being a purist and a sectarian. Book Chin didn't mind being dismissed as a purist, he said in reply if that was the label attached to those who upheld a principled commitment to radical change and coming from those who were virtually dissolving their principles in order to work with almost everyone, it was practically a compliment. In contrast to the present's amorphous ecumenism, he yearned for the kind of embattled commitment and social idealism that had marked revolutionaries of the past. In 1793 Danton had memorably roared, El Audes. El Audes. Encore El Audes. By contrast, today's self-styled radicals demurely carry attaché cases of memoranda and grant requests into their conference rooms. Many were joining Barry Commoner's Citizens Party which called for economic democracy and environmentalism, but it was merely an effort to channel radical impulses into the mainstream, like all conventional parties, it offered a maraschino cherry to everyone while defusing serious challenges to the system. Where radical politics once stood for full citizen empowerment, it now stood for the empowerment of professional politicians in state and national government, where it once endorsed democratic assemblies, it now recommended the numbing quietude of the polling booth, the deadening platitudes of petition campaigns, instead of complex social theory, its new métier was bumper sticker slogans, and instead of stirring demands for revolution, it meekly begged for paltry reforms.
people no longer wanted to dedicate themselves to a revolutionary project that might require the labors and dedication of a lifetime. Instead, they craved instant gratification and were willing to surrender their long-term ideals to get it. Indeed, the world of fast politics closely parallels the world of fast food. But the preference for instant success and immediate gratification leads to trade-offs and compromises, he warned. It leads to choosing the lesser evil over the greater good. It decouples politics from ethics. The way to rejoin them was to do what the ancient Greeks, for whom politics was infused with ethics, had done, build an assembly democracy in which all adult citizens could participate in decision-making processes, and to build a humane society in which the material means of life were communally owned, produced, and shared according to need. Amid the disappointments, Book Chin found ways to advance his project regardless. The teaching at Ramapo was satisfying, Book Chin had developed new courses on urban utopias, alternatives to modern medicine, and nature philosophy. Black Rose Books published his 1970s essays to acclaim from eco anarchist reviewers. Toward an Ecological Society was a work of crucial importance, wrote his protege John Clark. Practically every paragraph is filled with mind expanding ideas, observed Bob Long. Book Chin was recasting the emancipatory traditions of human history in contemporary form, wrote John Fakit of Trent University. And although Carl Hess's community technology projects in Washington had succumbed to rising crime, Charis was thriving in New York. In 1979 the group transformed an abandoned turn-of-the-century school building on East 9th Street into El Bohio Cultural and Community Center. For the next few decades, it would be an uplifting force in Lois Aida. One day in September 1979, Book Chin opened his mailbox to find a subpoena from the U.S. government, summoning him to testify at a trial in Washington. It took him a while to understand what it was all about. Since the 1950s, FBI agents had been spying on the American left by entering people's homes surreptitiously, without warrants, looking for evidence of wrongdoing. In 1972 the Supreme Court had declared these illegal searches unconstitutional. But at that moment the FBI had been intent on continuing the searches in order to get at the weather underground, whose members were then planting bombs in government and corporate buildings. But the weather people had gone underground, their whereabouts unknown the Bureau couldn't get at them. In 1973 the second and third ranking FBI officials, W. Mark Felt and Edward S. Miller, instructed agents to resume black bag jobs, in defiance of the Supreme Court's ruling. Agents were to break into the homes of friends and families of the weather people to look for evidence of the fugitives' activities. In February 1973, FBI agents had surreptitiously entered Book Chin's apartment at 235 2nd Avenue and searched it. 68 Evidently, someone had fed the FBI some false information about him. In the late 1970s, the U.S. Senate Committee investigated the illegal resumption of black bag jobs. On April 10, 1978, a federal grand jury charged Felt and Miller with conspiracy to violate the constitutional rights of American citizens by searching their homes surreptitiously and without warrants. The two FBI directors were to be tried in U.S. District Court in Washington. The special prosecutor, John Neilds, subpoenaed Book Chin to testify on behalf of the prosecution. On September 22, 1980, Book Chin entered the federal courthouse. He had to walk past hundreds of FBI rank and file who were lined up in military formation, loyal to their two chieftains, scowling at him. When he took the stand, Feltz and Miller's attorneys produced exhibits that made his hair stand on end, photos of his personal and political papers of all kinds, the Anarcho's mailing list, the address book that he had compiled in Europe in 1967, with contact information for expatriate Spanish anarchists, his list of anarchist contacts from the 1969 Chicago SDS conference, where the Weather Underground was born, and more. This last one they offered as compelling evidence of his connection to the Weather people. But Book Chin replied calmly all of these factions were Marxist, Leninist, and I believe Maoist. His own faction, the Radical Decentralist Caucus, he said, 
was adamantly opposed to them. The defense lawyers, unaware of any distinction between anarchists and Marxists, were taken aback. Are you saying, one asked, that the people that are on this list and attended this caucus would not be people that were affiliated or supporting the RYM1 or the Weatherman faction of the SDS? Book Chin replied, I would hope that they weren't, otherwise they were in the wrong faction. But look here, said one bewildered lawyer. Your so-called anarchist list contains the name Jeff Jones. And Jeff Jones, as we all know, went on to become a leader of the weather underground. Book Chin replied that there were two people named Jeff Jones. The one on his list lived in Austin and was a student leader at the University of Texas. He is not the Jeff Jones who was normally associated with the weathermen. A defense attorney asked him questions about weather people. Had he ever been at a meeting with Kathy Wilkerson or Kathy Budin? I was never at any meeting of the weathermen or weather bureau, whatever they choose to call themselves. Were you ever at a meeting attended by Mark Rod? Oh hell no, excuse me, I'm sorry. Do you know a libel Bergman? A what? Next, a government lawyer questioned him. You are neither a friend or a relative of any weatherman fugitive, isn't that correct? Yes. And if the indictment in this case alleges that you are a relative or an acquaintance of a weatherman fugitive, it is just flat wrong, isn't it? I would say so, Murray replied. Across the courtroom, John Neal's teared up. Had he ever written about the weathermen? Murray said no, but he had written often against the Marxism that was their ideology. His listen, Marxist, was vehemently anti-Marxist, anti-Leninist, anti-Maoist. Mr. Bookchin, were your views on that subject well known in the community in 1972 and early 1973? Very well known. I have no further questions, Your Honor. By this time, Niels was sobbing tears of joy, the trial had barely begun, and the defense's case was in debris. During that recess, a defense lawyer actually went over to the government lawyers and congratulated them. Book Chin returned to Burlington, and the trial continued for another few weeks. Five former attorneys general, as well as former President Nixon, testified on behalf of Felt and Miller. On November 6, the jury returned its verdict, Felt and Miller were guilty of violating citizens' constitutional rights. It was a victory for the Fourth Amendment and the Bill of Rights. Niels told Bookchin that his testimony had been primary in gaining that verdict. At the 1980 summer session of the ISE, student Leo Chaput constructed a solar heating system that could warm a house as well as an aquaculture system. Introducing algae into the system's water made it dark green, which boosted the water's heat absorption, which made it warm enough to support fish. He raised fish and used their waste as fertilizer for the gardens. He raised worms for fish food, in a medium containing rabbit droppings, and he raised the rabbits and grew the rabbit food in the solar greenhouse. The whole thing is interconnected, he told an interviewer. Meanwhile, Book Chin kept the goals of social ecology clear, it wasn't about the technology alone, it was about getting rid of the domination of nature by eliminating the domination of human by human. For several years now, Inistra King had been teaching her women an ecology class at the ISE, featuring a version of cultural feminism known as ecofeminism, a term Book Chin invented. According to ecofeminism, the domination of women is connected to the ecological domination of the planet. The patriarchal society that demeans women is the same society that has brought about acid rain and global warming. Strikingly patriarchy demeans women in terms of nature, it regards them as closer to nature than men, as more natural, less rational, and so on. In the age of ecological resistance, eco-feminists decided to recast the demeaning patriarchal analogies between women and nature in a positive light and present women as ecologically enlightened. Emotionality compassion, peacefulness, qualities associated with women, are a necessary part of the solution to the ecological crisis, eco-feminists argued. If women are more natural than men, they said, that is not a defect but a boon, it means they can mediate our society's return to nature. 
the perpetuation of gender stereotypes might be troubling, but King and other eco-feminists argued for embracing this imagery for positive political purposes. In March 1980, King and her colleagues joined together to form Women for Life on Earth to oppose nuclear power and nuclear weapons. Identifying war-making as male and patriarchy as militaristic, they argued that women had a strong interest in and linked to peacemaking. On November 17, 1980, 2,000 female activists assembled in Washington for a four-stage women's Pentagon action. The Pentagon, their statement read, is the workplace of the imperial power which threatens us all. Using large puppets and cardboard tombstones and brightly colored yarn, banging on cans and chanting take the toys from the boys, they encircled the Pentagon, hand in hand, singing peace songs. With its defiant radical energy and imaginative symbolism, ecofeminism impressed Book Chin. Its proponents, he said, were now at the forefront of anti-militarist as well as ecological activities, demanding an end to hierarchy and domination in all their varieties. Ecofeminism, if fused with an anarchist movement, he thought, could open one of the most exciting and liberating decades of our century. But what anarchist movement? Since no dedicated eco-anarchist organization existed, Bookchin set out to create one, with the broad goal of eradicating hierarchy and domination. In the summer of 1980, he and several northern Vermont affinity groups invited other groups throughout the region to join them in creating a New England Anarchist Conference, NEAC. It would be structured, once again, as a confederation of affinity groups, in which decisions were made from the bottom up, it would focus on creating direct personal and collective empowerment at the local level so that as the movement grew in numbers and strength, citizens would have the consciousness and experience necessary to manage their own communities through popular assemblies, leading to a truly democratic and non-hierarchical society. By now, Book Chin was wary of movements whose members were uneducated in radical social theory and history. He had seen SDS lose its moorings when the hitherto non-political hippies had flooded in, and he had seen the anti-nuclear movement, once it became popular, deteriorate into alternative energy fairs and rock concerts. To his mind, the movement NEAC spawned could remain small, at least initially, the number of its members was less important to him than their quality as activists and teachers. Indeed, he actively preferred a handful of members to a large movement, for only members who were committed and educated would be capable of moving history forward. More than 175 anarchists from New England, New York, New Jersey, and Quebec attended NEAC's founding conference, held on October 17-19, 1980, at Goddard. They discussed anarchism in relation to ecology feminism, militarism, and urban alternatives and adopted the proposed structure and resolves. It was a promising start. In January 1981 the second NEAC conference convened, in Somerville, Massachusetts, but the conference showed itself to be not up to the task of creating a movement. The 125 participants got lost in identity politics, as Brian Toker told me. Book Chin would have to look elsewhere for the kind of educated activists necessary to create the movement he had in mind. After the ISC's summer 1980 session ended, Book Chin resigned as director, saying he'd had enough of dealing with the Goddard administration and wanted more time to write. Dan Choderkoff, who had by now earned his PhD in cultural anthropology at the New School, took the Institute's helm. At that moment Goddard was having serious financial troubles. Declining enrollment was one reason, the kind of self-designed, independent study that Goddard had pioneered could by 1980 be found at other schools, at lower cost. But the college had also mismanaged its finances, it had a $1 million debt, and the bank was threatening to foreclose unless it produced a balanced budget. Rumors flew that the school was going to lose its accreditation. The ISE itself, however, was going strong. There's nothing like it in the world, Book Chin told a reporter around this time. The ISE has been imitated, agreed Choderkoff but never really equaled. If Goddard were to go under, the ISE could continue, its finances were in the black. 
perhaps it could even buy Kate Farm and establish a living learning program there. In December 1980, Choderkoff let Goddard know that the ISE was interested in purchasing Kate Farm, and negotiations began. In early 1981, Goddard teetered on the brink. In May its accreditation went on hold. So its board members bit the bullet, they sold its off-campus programs to a nearby university laid off most faculty and staff, and reduced the student body by 80%. And they decided to sell off some of its 450 acres. The ISE negotiated with the bank for a mortgage, but in the midst of the negotiations, Goddard suddenly decided the interest rate was too high and terminated the discussion. Instead of selling it to the ISE, it put Kate Farm, along with other land parcels, on the market. It cancelled the ISE's 1981 summer program, two weeks before it was to begin. It seized the ISE's equipment and put the buildings and other structures under lock and key. Shocked, the ISE asked a local wealthy friend to buy Kate Farm and lease it to them. The buyer agreed, and in September 1981 his group made a 10% down payment. But once the sale went through, he ignored the agreement with the ISE and established a private farm on the land. On September 30, 1981, its collective radical heartbreaking, the ISE bade farewell to the solar panels, the sunhouse, the geodesic dome, the windmills, the compost shed, the solar food dehydrator, and the thermosiphoning air panel. It bade farewell to Kate Farm, the mountains, and the natural sauna. The ISE was now homeless. From the YCL's ideology of proletarian insurgency of the 1930s to Weber's theory of retrogression in the 1950s to the revolutionary youth of 1968-69, Marxists had been predicting that the demise of capitalism in the industrialized West was imminent. But looking back in retrospect from 1980, Bookchin saw that capitalism in those years had only just been beginning to consolidate itself. Far from collapsing from some internal contradiction, and far from being toppled by a mass movement of the oppressed, it had flourished, boomed, explosively, even globally. It had mocked every prediction that Marxists had flung at it since the end of World War II. Now it was already so consolidated that it had even become more than an economy, it had become both socially and psychologically a given. That being the case Bookchin had to admit that the revolutionary era, too, had almost certainly come to an end. The era of proletarian revolution had begun on the barricades of June 1848, continued through the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, and reached its zenith in the Spanish Revolution of 1936, the greatest of them all. But it had ended on the barricades of Barcelona in May 1937, the last great historic confrontation. Castro in Cuba, Mao in China, Ho in Vietnam, so admired by the left, had been peasant revolutions aiming for modernization, not proletarian ones aiming for socialism. The 1960s upheaval had been furious and turbulent, but it had not been genuinely revolutionary. During the 1970s, revelations about Marxist bloodbaths in China and Cambodia and elsewhere had redefined revolution from potentially liberatory to actually catastrophic. But the greatest desecrator of the revolutionary remained Stalin, who had made the very idea of revolution fearsome, synonymous with dictatorship, murder, and gulags. The red flag had been stained more by the blood of its own revolutionary bearers than its reactionary opponents. Yet despite its triumph, capitalism continued to gnaw away at the biosphere, continued to undermine the foundations of all life on the planet. It continued to exploit workers, and it continued to inject itself into every aspect of social life, commodifying even interpersonal relations, personal character structure, demeaning people from citizens active in their communities to isolated consumers. The election of Ronald Reagan in November signaled that individualism had triumphed as the national ideology. Nothing requiring collective action or consciousness, let alone environmentalism, and let alone social ecology, would be on the agenda anytime soon. Bookchin consoled himself that his own failure to create a social ecology movement to this point did not negate the problem at hand or invalidate social ecology as an idea.
To be in the minority is not necessarily testimony to the futility of an ideal, he observed. On the contrary a humanly scaled, communal, ecological society remained as necessary as ever to avert ecological catastrophe, regardless of circumstances. Contrary to generations of radicals, capitalism would not perish from internal contradictions, he concluded. If it were to die, it would die only like a cancer, that is, only when, having grown out of control, like a tumor, it destroys its host, the host being society and the biosphere. And when it perished, it would take the rest of humanity and probably most other species, down with it. The only possible alternative was for an eco-anarchist movement to arise that would corrode, weaken, and hollow it out by warning humanity of the social and ecological peril it faced and by inducing the majority of people to take action and create an ecological, decentralized, and rational society. But the end of the revolutionary era deprived social ecology of the activist tradition upon which he had always thought a social ecology would depend. Given that reality he knew he must dwell on the margins of experience and practice and try to make the best of it, even as the center seems triumphant. He told people I'm one of those characters that lives on the dark side of the moon. From the margins, he could still demand the impossible demand utopia. And untethered from current developments, he need make no apologies for it. He comforted himself, too, with a quote from Marx's 18th Brumaire, Men make history, but not under conditions of their own choosing. Still, quietly he made a subtle shift in his writing. In the past he had often distinguished between the what is and the what could be. The phrase what could be implies a possibility of practical attainment, but now he no longer used it. Instead, he replaced it with what should be, a moral standpoint, making no reference to the practical attainment. Living on the margins would mean writing in the subjunctive.